Good evening. My name is Jay Feinberg, and I'm Gift of Life's founder and CEO. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to Gift of Life's Florida Town Hall, addressing healthcare disparities in our communities. I'd like to thank our organizing partner, the NAACP, and our sponsors, Morgan Stanley, Fidelity Investments, the McKesson, McKesson Corporation, and Rubius Therapeutics for their tremendous support. Today's topic could not be more timely or important. We have watched as COVID-19 has spread throughout the United States, leaving a trail of human destruction in its wake. And we have been reminded of the inequities that permeate healthcare, resulting in unequal outcomes for people of color. These disparities extend far beyond our mission to provide a cure for those battling diseases like blood cancer, immunodeficiencies, and sickle cell. But as part of our mission to create equal healthcare opportunity outcomes for everyone, we are compelled to take action addressing not only this, but the larger issue that the pandemic has further exposed. My personal story began in the early 1990s when I was diagnosed with leukemia. Naturally, I was devastated, but I was relieved to learn that a bone marrow transplant could save my life. First though, I needed to find a matching bone marrow donor. It wasn't until I met with a transplant physician in New York that I was told that I would never find that match because of my Jewish genetic heritage. You see, I had no idea that tissue type is inherited, like eye or hair color. So the best chance of finding a genetic match lies with people of similar race and ethnicity. Unfortunately, the donor registry was not ethnically and racially diverse, likening the search to looking for a needle in a haystack. Thankfully, with a lot of hard work and a four-year high-profile grassroots campaign, I found my match. Now it's my life's mission to pay it forward. Every patient deserves an equal opportunity to benefit from the treatment that can save their life. The registry must be representative of people of all backgrounds, period. To help give voice to this message, and encourage others to join in the fight against blood diseases. Gift of Life has launched a new short film in collaboration with rapper and lyricist Terrell Trizzy Miles with creative support from the Lucy Collective and The Mill. And now allow me to introduce Blood is Thicker. So, Terrell, what made you want to write this book? Because blood is thicker than water, like fathers, mothers, sons, and daughters. But what if I told you the blood relation can go farther than the people you know? You have the power to save a life with a simple swab of the cheek. That's all you need to make someone else's life complete. For those like me or from a different creed, no matter what you look like, there's someone out there who you can be, a hero to, a vessel of new life. Someone who can bring them light when the road seems weak. For those who seek bone marrow or stem cells, through this one gesture, they will be allowed to prevail and tell the tale of how one small act managed to break the scale. And their life was allowed to once again set sail. To heights unknown, to love once more. The gift of life from my family to yours. Absolutely incredible. Terrell, if you're here listening, congratulations. You are so talented. The film you just saw, Blood is Thicker, is one of the initiatives we've put in place to educate communities on these very important issues. This town hall is another. And so in partnership with the NAACP and Dynamic Changemakers, we are pleased to have you join us for this one of many meaningful conversations about ensuring that Black indigenous and people of color have safe, effective, and full access to healthcare and life-saving treatments. And now it is my great pleasure to welcome today's moderator, former NBA player and leukemia advocate, the incredible Walter Bond. Awesome, awesome, awesome. You know what, Jay, thank you from the bottom of my heart for being an impact player. To kind of kick this off, I mean, what you've done for the gift of life just goes beyond words. And so what I wanna do right now is to be the moderator. 
And what I want to do is hopefully be an impact player for you. Just real briefly, so you understand where I'm coming from. I'm not a Florida native. I live here in Boca Raton, Florida. I'm a Chicago guy from the South Side. And this is how I grew up. My father was a high school principal. My mom was a kindergarten teacher. And I'm the youngest in my family. All I wanted to do was play pro sports. I didn't care about school. I didn't care about anything else. All I wanted to do was play pro sports. You see, my uncle, I was named after played in the major leagues. My dad is in the Hall of Fame at his college. My big sister won two national championships playing at the University of Southern California. And I'm the youngest, I'm the baby, and I'm the best athlete in the family. I didn't care about anything but playing ball. What I didn't realize is that my transformation as a person began through adversity. You see, I flunked out of my first high school. I was so focused on sports that I forgot the importance of getting educated. I forgot the importance of how far education can take us. Now here's the crazy part. My father was a high school principal. My mom was a kindergarten teacher. I grew up with two parents who preached education all the time. Both of my parents are college graduates, but I was so focused on sports. I could have cared less about school. But when I flunked out of my first high school, I realized I let my parents down. And honestly, I was embarrassed. I transferred to my new high school. This was crazy. My first high school, I wore penny loafers and polo shirts. I was Carlton, the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. When I got to my new high school, I'm in the hood. 50% of the girls were pregnant, thugs on the corner, but that wasn't even the worst part. The worst part was when I went by the principal's office, the principal was 6'6", 240 pounds. Everybody else called him Mr. Bond. I called him dad. Yes, my dad transferred me to his high school in the hood. And that's when my life began to transform. And that's when I began to understand poverty. That's when I began to realize, man, there's two black communities. That's when I began to get educated on what's really happening in this world around us. And we got to wake up. Every morning on the way to school, my dad would talk to me. He said, son, you're just as smart as my other two kids, but your value system is screwed up. You're just as smart as your brother and sister, but your value system is screwed up. This family produces student athletes. This family produces student athletes. Every morning on the way to school, my father would build my confidence and set expectation. Build my confidence and set expectation. Build my confidence and set expectation. And my father had me write some goals down. Never forget it. 17 years old, he said, son, write your goals down. I got in the car and I said, dad, you ready? I'm gonna graduate college in four years. I'm gonna play in the NBA. And when I'm done playing in the NBA, I'm gonna make more money in business than I did in sports. Ladies and gentlemen, every morning my dad would build my confidence and he set expectation. I made it to the NBA. And when I got done playing in the NBA, I was disappointed. I was somewhat sad. I grabbed my wife and I asked her, I said, you know what? I've been fighting for the NBA my whole life. There's gotta be more to life than this. I've been fighting for the NBA my whole life and I made money, I, I got here, but it's gotta be more to life than this. And as soon as I left the NBA, I realized my NBA experience was for me and everything else I've done since is for you. You see my uncle I was named after, he died of leukemia. He was only 29 years old playing for the Minnesota Twins. He died of leukemia. And that's why I got named after my uncle. So I want you to understand that blood cancer runs deep. I want you to understand that I, my namesake, I am the namesake of my dad's brother who died of leukemia. You see, I lost my dad to prostate cancer. We didn't even talk about that tonight. Prostate cancer attacks black men. Leukemia is an issue we deal with in our community. Tonight, I'm here to tell you, I came to be an impact player. Tonight, we're gonna to have a great conversation. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about a lot. Let me help you understand one thing. I have never been a spectator in my life. I have always been a participant. I have never been a spectator in my life. 
I have always been a participant. So that's my message for everyone at the town hall tonight. All you college kids, high school kids, it's not about being a spectator. Tonight, we gotta be participants because this world is crazy right now. I mean, we gotta deal with social injustice. I lived in Minneapolis for 25 years. That same street where George Floyd got murdered. I've walked down that street a million different times. We got to understand that we're in a pandemic. This is something we have never, ever seen in our lifetime. We might not ever see again, but we got to deal with it. And we got to deal with the disparities that are hitting our communities. We got so much to talk about tonight. But I want you to have the right mindset. I want you to get your mindset in the same position that I'm in. It's not about being a spectator anymore. It's about being a participant. And I came tonight to be your impact player. And I'm telling you, health disparity has rocked my family. My very name was derived from health disparities. So tonight we have an expert council and I'm gonna put on my glasses just so I can see everything clearly, because I feel like my role tonight is so important. I mean, we've had 8 million people contract coronavirus, and there's been 220,000 deaths, and you guys know as well as I do, it's attacking the Black community. And we have a greater chance of contracting it, and we got a greater chance of dying from it. Why? Because the health disparity that we got to talk about tonight. So I want you to make sure that you're staying healthy. I want to make sure you're doing everything you can to be an impact player. But we need you to take care of your health so you can live on this earth as long as you can have an impact. So right now, I want to turn to my panel. And all I want to do is ask this distinguished panel a bunch of questions because we got to get serious tonight about our community. And as far as I'm concerned, this is a locker room conversation. See, a lot of times we get excited about what happens in the world around us and we wanna go out and protest. And we wanna do a lot of things publicly, but as far as I'm concerned, tonight is a locker room conversation that we gotta talk about some serious issues and we gotta be alert. I got three kids, 25, 22, and 23, just graduated from Howard University and they always using the word woke. You gotta be woke, dad. You gotta stay woke, dad. But tonight it's about being woke. Tonight is about being alert. So I want everybody to put their thinking caps on and try and figure out how can you be a participant? How can you be an impact player? First of all, I want to welcome all of our panelists tonight. We got a great lineup tonight. We have Dr. Kelly Tice Wells, family physician. We have Mrs. K Dr. Karen Vieira and my man Kai Corbin, all right? First of all, let's, let's go to you right now, Dr. Kelly. Now, how has health disparities from your lens because of the coronavirus become so obvious? I mean, it's like the elephant in the room has finally reared its ugly head. How has coronavirus highlighted something you've known been going around for a long time? Sure, and thank you, Walter. I'm so glad to have the chance to, to participate in, in what I know is going to be a, a real conversation because clearly that's what it's going to take. You know, those of us who have done this work as uh, primary care physicians uh, for years and years, uh, be it public sector or private sector, um, those who've been in healthcare and other capacities have long been doing this work. We have been uh, uh, helping patients uh, attain good outcomes. And the way to do that is to be sure that they can they can purchase their prescription. They, they have transportation to and from the physician's office, that they know how to navigate the healthcare system and, and get to a specialist if necessary or to uh, get diagnostic uh, tests completed. We've been doing that work and it is a part of what it is to be a clinician. And we have long recognized that there is a certain segment of the population that suffers uh, a higher burden of disease and illness than other segments of the population. And so we worked harder for those folks, for minorities, uh, specifically for blacks in our practices, in our hospitals, in our emergency rooms. Um, we have watched as the, the systems that have are structured to improve health, health outcomes have focused on those uh, uh, areas of the population. So that have addressed what we call the social determinants of health. That, that's not new. We've got these goals we set every decade about how we're going to impact outcomes. What we fail to do, 
and where we have failed uh, ourselves and certainly we have failed the young folks who have been who are watching us is we have failed to acknowledge that the drivers of the things that were impacting those outcomes that the major driver is structural racism and individual discrimination that the things that make it hard for you to control your chronic disease for instance are things uh, who, to, whose access is influenced by and, and, and impacted by uh, things that can be determined by racism and discrimination. So access to healthy foods uh, and ability to live in a community that is walkable, right? So as, as we uh, have folks who seek care and are told to, to you know, change, modify your diet, lose a few pounds and exercise more, we fail to recognize that there are many members of the population who frankly cannot accomplish those things. And in many cases, it's due to things that are beyond their control. Now, what COVID did was lay bare all of those things, right? You have uh, an illness that is contagious before you have symptoms, and you have an illness that makes uh, worse the course of illness for someone who has chronic illnesses. And it is, uh, it, it is a significantly increased risk for folks who have a chronic illness that's not under well control. So if you have an uncontrolled diabetic or someone with hypertension or heart disease who doesn't have great access to the things that are necessary to be healthy, well, that is the reason that we're seeing such an increased burden of, of poor outcomes in minority communities and specifically in the black communities. So it's time now for us to get it right. Um, as I've talked to colleagues who are doing this work and have been in this fight for a significant period of time, we've all decided the door's open and now we've all got to walk through it. And no matter where you sit, where if you are, as I am, working in the payer environment to ensure and address health disparities from the payer side, or if you are still a practicing clinician that is working hard to ensure that your patients get what you need, what they need, or if you are a member of the, the healthcare community, uh, everybody has got to walk through this open door and begin to have the conversations that we've that we have left unaddressed there is the the risk of of not fully addressing the mistrust of the health system there are physicians who operate and function with bias that is unrecognized to some extent there are diseases and illnesses for which there um, is not adequate attention research treatment uh, and available uh, uh, specialty care for that inordinately affects uh, minority populations. And so it is time through conversations like this for us to begin to talk about the real drivers of these things and ensure that as a, as a result of these conversations, we now have empowered the health consumer, the patients, the young folks that we're talking to, your parents, your loved ones, the folks in your families that are impacted by this, empowered them then to make the appropriate and healthy choice and to demand that the, there be a system out there that allows them to do so. Well, you know, here's a follow-up question. And to your point, I mean, this is really about money. Let's be, let's be honest. And, and, and I've been very fortunate to be able to make money, got great insurance. And I told you my dad died of prostate cancer. My uncle died of leukemia. So cancer is real in my family. And my wife went and found me a urologist who's African-American, uh, based right here in Coral Springs, happens to be a member of my fraternity, Kappa Alpha Psi, and he's a world-renowned urologist. Mm -hmm. I mean, world-renowned urologist right here. And you can just tell the care was a lot more intimate. I felt like the care was a lot more caring. And I had seen another doctor from another persuasion who knew the history of my family never followed up with me. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, I'm 51 years old. My dad had prostate, all my uncles had prostate and you don't even follow up with me? I knew right there like something's wrong, something is wrong. So my wife took it upon herself to find me a urologist based right here in South Florida. And this brother is world renowned. So I wanna talk about insurance because if it's about money, we need to hear about Florida Blue and what is Florida Blue doing? Because I don't want to get too political, but I know the Affordable Care Act is important where people can get access to good health care. So you can fight sickle cell and leukemia and prostate. You got to have some care to be able to get the best doctors. So tell us about Florida Blue and how is how important is it for our young people to understand to have access to good health care is going to require you to be alert and be, be able to just afford some good insurance. 
Well, certainly Florida Blue is in the wonderful position of having the opportunity to provide care and coverage uh, for uh, members in every county in our state. Uh, and because we are the, the largest insurer in the state and because we have a, a very significant presence in terms of um, uh, marketplace plans, it, then I, I think we have a, a vested in, interest in ensuring that not only we were able to maintain that, but, but even move toward expanding coverage. Access is something that you know, we talk a lot about, but we need to recognize where it begins. So access to care means that you have the ability to be on your parents' insurance plan, for instance, uh, while you complete your education. And so, you know, making that extension, having four kids myself, two of whom are in college, that coverage is really critical. Um, being someone who is who is working a job and and needs coverage and needs to understand what that coverage is. Um, I think we have to work to in empower that particular segment of the, the healthcare population. We have a group of consumers out there who are eligible for coverage, but haven't accessed it. And, and it's through the, the marketplace plans that we have the ability to get folks out there so that they can be insured. I think that, that particularly in the black community, there, there is a segment of the population that, that just isn't aware that there is, they're eligible for, for coverage. And, the consequences of not being covered. And, and so certainly there's some messaging that we can do around that. And what, what we hope to do is really expand the number of members that we're able to cover through educational uh, efforts such as this. What we are building, what we're creating, and what we're looking to empower are healthcare consumers. And often we, we posture ourselves, we position ourselves as if we don't have choice. So, so what we would want to have happen is that, that every member have the opportunity to do what your wife did for you, which is identify, recognize the fact that maybe this, the physician that you've established care with isn't meeting your needs. And, and you can take your healthcare dollar and, and find a clinician that does meet your needs. Studies show that outcomes are, are improved when you can have a physician who is of similar um, ethnic or, or racial persuasion. And, and in fact, one of the, our initiatives, one of our focuses is to increase the diversity of our provider networks to accomplish that. And that means not just your primary care physicians, right? It means also your specialty care physicians, because when you uh, have a diagnosis that puts you at risk, we want you to get that same level of care and have that same level of connection with a physician of similar background when, if and when you have to access services in that manner. So, so I, I think the, the role of the payer is, is key and critical. One, to empower and to educate members in terms of what it is that, that you've bought and what you need to do with it, but also to expand our reach so that we can uh, maintain the coverage we've got and get uh, other folks who are eligible but not currently covered onto plans so that they can also connect to care. And, and, and Dr. Wells, let me tell you something. When, when the urologist came in, um, his dad was a urologist. He's a urologist. His brother's a urologist. And as soon as I gave him my family history, he was like, I want to see you every six months. I mean, so I had one doctor did not call me back. He understood what was at stake. And he was like, I want to see you every six months. And so when I left the doctor this week, I had to make my next appointment for April. And that's what I'm talking about. You know, just getting doctor care. They have a doctor who cares. Now, let me shift to Dr. Karen Vieira because last night my mind was blown. I had never heard that medicine can be racist. <laughs> now I'm from Chicago and I knew Popo and Five-O, whatever you want to call them. They've been beating brothers up for years. So, you know, I live in a neighborhood where a lot of my residents are like, Walter, you know, what's going on with the cops? I'm like, excuse me? Like, it's like, what's going on? I was like, they've been having police brutality since the 60s. The only thing that changed is these cell phones. The only thing changed, we can videotape it now. And they look at me like, I'm basically talking crazy. And I'm like, just letting them know, like, look, police brutality is not new. The only thing that is new are cameras. But my mind got blown last night. We had a special guest, David Lax. You gotta go see the movie, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lax. And I don't even wanna, just go watch the movie. I mean, it, it was heartbreaking what they did to this African-American lady. Um, she has some tissue 
that survived incredible treatments. And because of her tissue staying alive, um, they sold it to a medical um, pharmaceutical company and they're making millions and millions and millions of dollars off of Henrietta Lacks tissue and didn't even tell her family. So not only are they healing people and curing people, they didn't even let them share in the money until they figured out what was going on. So again, you know, Dr. Henry Vieira, um, I'm sorry, Karen Vieira, I, I just want to talk about sickle cell. Before we talk about the racial disparity of sickle cell or the racism around the investment or the, the, the focus on sickle cell because it's a black disease. First of all, explain to us what sickle cell is and that you not only research it, you are actually dealing with sickle cell yourself. So just kind of, just, just take us down the path of what it's all about. Absolutely, thanks Walter. Um, so sickle cell is a disease that a lot of people don't know a lot about. And so for me, when I meet people and I have a conversation about having sickle cell, most people ask me, what is it? Um, they've never heard of it, or if they have heard the name, they've heard it in passing, they don't really understand the disease. Sickle cell is a disease, a, a rare genetic disease. Um, you may have heard of cystic fibrosis and other rare genetic diseases. Um, and it's a rare genetic disease, unfortunately affecting in America, mostly blacks and around the world, mostly blacks. And the way it works is that it affects our red, red blood cells. They're not able to perform the same way that a healthy person's red blood cells perform. So what happens is, when the red blood cells are deoxygenated, which means they don't have oxygen that they're carrying, they're unfortunately uh, shoved into a sickle shape. And it's called sickle cell because that sickle shape, you know, looks like a sickle that you would use to cut grass. And I know most of us have never cut grass with a sickle, but we've probably seen a movie or something that has it. And that sickle shaped red blood cell is not flexible, it gets stuck in the smaller blood vessels. And when it gets stuck, it's causing things to back up. So imagine it's cutting off your oxygen supply because now blood is not flowing through the blood vessels to get where they need to get to. And so certain parts of the body then are not getting oxygen. Without oxygen, it causes tremendous pain because our body's not made to live without oxygen. And so, people that have sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia, um, we live with a lot of pain. So the slightest thing, dehydration, a lack of sleep, stress, these things can trigger a sickle cell crisis, which is where these red blood cells get deoxygenated, form that sickle shape and get stuck. So we really, we deal with a lot of pain. Um, anybody you know with sickle cell, your heart really should go out to them because it is not an easy life. Um, I have two kids and I've told people, you know, my worst sickle cell crisis, the pain of childbirth can't touch that. So people don't understand what people with sickle cell go through, but it's a very intense disease. And here in America, my experience with it, um, both as a sickle cell patient, as, as a sickle cell advocate as well, and as a sickle cell researcher is that most of the people that I have encountered that have sickle cell tend to be in a lower socioeconomic class, tend to have less education. And unfortunately, they're in a place where they really can't advocate for themselves. They really don't even understand their disease and what they can do um, to help themselves. And their access to healthcare, proper healthcare, like Walter was just talking about, proper healthcare is limited. So these are all major issues with sickle cell. So what can we do? I got, I got two questions. Dr. Karen, you're a smart lady. You do research, you're an advocate. Um, I wanna set the stage right now. What can we do? I got two questions. What can we do to make the healthcare system more equitable, equitable and educate us? Isn't it true that sometimes when two adults are carriers of some type of DNA gene, that they are more likely to produce a child who has sickle cell. Educate us on that. And then teachers, what can we do um, to draw more attention to make the healthcare system more equitable for sickle cell? Absolutely. So your, quest your second question I'll answer first, which is the genetics of how sickle cell is inherited. And um, all rare genetic diseases are basically inherited the same way. 
Um, both parents are carriers of the disease, probably unknowingly so. My parents didn't even know what sickle cell was. They never even heard of it prior to me getting diagnosed. Um, so two parents carrying a disease or a trait for a disease and everybody gets DNA from their mom and from their dad. And so what happens is you get one from your mom, one from your dad is kind of like an unlucky roll of the dice. So I have a sister, she has the trait. She got one bad one from one parent and one good one from the other parent. So imagine both of my parents have a good one and a bad one. And then I got the bad one from both of them. My sister got a good one and a bad one. Another child could have gotten two good ones. So it's just the roll of the dice. And for sickle cell, it's a one in four chance. If you have two people with the trait that don't have the disease, it's a one in four chance that they have a child with the disease. And so that's you know typical for all genetic, rare genetic diseases like sickle cell. Um, so that's why it's very important within the black community for us to get tested for sickle cell, know whether we have the trait or not. Um, when, when our young people get into relationships, they need to know their sickle cell status and they need to know their partner's sickle cell status. That is very important so that we are not unknowingly having kids with sickle cell because it's a very disempowering feeling to watch your child in pain all the time and there's nothing you can really do to help. And so you don't want to knowingly end up with kids with sickle cell if you can avoid it. And I'm not saying you're gonna pick your partners based on their sickle cell status, but you will be more informed and able to make better decisions about choices. And some people can choose to get um, testing done in, in, um, you know, in the fetus, there's all kinds of, you know, I don't know that fancy stuff as well as I know the genetics of the disease, but I do know that it's very important to get tested. And so for me, my kids do not have sickle cell disease because I was not having kids with somebody that had the sickle cell trait. Um, so they have the trait for me because that's all they could inherit, but they don't have the disease, um, which thank goodness for that. To answer your other question, Walter, which is a bigger question, you know, what do we do? Um, how do we change the conversations? How do we change the trajectory of healthcare in America? I really feel like that's what you asked me. Um, and the disparity for those with sickle cell, which is, you know, near and dear to my heart. So I'll speak on what I know. I'm not gonna be able to speak on every disease out there, but I know sickle cell in and out. Um, and what can we do is start conversations because conversations open doorways and education is the key, right? Knowledge is power. And so when we start talking about these things and they don't hide like skeletons in the closet anymore, but we actually start having conversations like these that we're having tonight, where we talk about the disparities. We talk about the fact that everybody knows cystic fibrosis. Unfortunately, cystic fibrosis is a white disease and sickle cell is a black disease. So why does everybody know cystic fibrosis? Why is there a lot more funding for that? Why are there a lot more organizations raising funds for research for helping the patients themselves? And why is nobody helping sickle cell patients? I'll tell you, I've been involved in a lot of local foundations and so on, and not knocking them, they're doing the best they can, but the funding isn't there. Who's donating? Nobody. Um, because they are in bad neighborhoods. They're in lower income neighborhoods because that's where the people they serve live. And they don't have money. I, I know people with sickle cell who call up their local sickle cell organizations or even on the national level. And, you know, they're struggling. A lot of people I know with sickle cell, they're on disability. And we all know that disability money in America does not go very far. Um, most people with sickle cell are unable to work. I'm the healthiest sickler I know. I don't know any other people with sickle cell as healthy as I am. I know a few that are decently healthy um, and we work very hard to be this healthy. I exercise every day. I, I don't drink anything but water. I get you know my eight hours of sleep. I keep my stress levels very low. I own my own business and I manage my stress. Um, but most people with sickle cell, they can't work, they're on disability, they're struggling to pay their bills, there's no help. 
they're uneducated they it's just it's a it's a real catch 22 and it's about starting these conversations and seeing where we can lead them to getting the skeletons out the closet bring it out in the light and see where we can get to with these conversations to make a difference in our communities well you know here's the truth you know we, we all got to be honest you know because of the coronavirus or COVID 19 or whatever you want to call it i mean there's been an expedited rush to get a vaccine, right? Because there's a lot of attention drawn to it. And the old saying is that the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So we got to figure out to make more noise. You know, I don't know what that is. I don't know how we're going to do it. But you know what? Gift of life, that is our job. So all you young people in these town hall meetings, we got to be serious. I believe in you. You know, a lot of times older people say all these young kids just don't get it. They just want to do Instagram all day. And they just want to talk all day and smoke weed all day. Not the kids on tonight's call. The kids on tonight call are serious. You know, they, they, they're not on IG and, and taking pictures of their lunch. You know, they're spending time with us tonight and I'm making a request to be an impact player. We got to draw attention to sickle cell. We got to draw attention to police brutality. We got to draw attention to affordable health care because if we don't draw attention to it, you know, it's going to continue to get brushed aside. For whatever reason, George Floyd's death sparked something. Right, we've been talking about police brutality a long time, but that moment sparked something. Even some of my neighbors were calling me and saying, Walter, what can we do? That's horrible. What can we do? And so, at any moment, you know, that little spark can turn into a flame. Speaking of that, we got to talk about another issue that's really impacting our community, and that's mental health. I know there's a lot of stigmas around mental health, and we throw these words around, you know, growing up, you know, not to be funny. You know, black people love to diagnose people. You guys know that. And so when I grew up, you were either, you know, stupid or crazy. Right? That's what my mom and grandmother, you know, that person's stupid or they crazy. It was like official diagnosis. But we threw these words like crazy around so flippantly that nobody wants to label themselves as crazy. But we have a real mental health epidemic. And so our next guest, Kai Korber, uh, UCAL Berkeley student, uh, was involved in an unfortunate incident at Parkland High School. And, and if you're from Florida, anywhere near Florida, we remember Parkland and those videos. Parkland's right around the corner from me. I'm talking 15 minutes. I mean, some of those bullets could have hit me. So welcome, Kai uh, Corber. And just tell us about your Parkland experience. But most importantly, what inspired you to do something about it to help people deal with mental health challenges? Yeah, so um, when I first started my activism in Parkland, you know, one of the things that really caught my attention was that we were having all these marches and we were doing all these things for the gun, con gun control legislation, but no one was actually thinking about the communities that were being affected. Nobody was thinking about the way mental health um, played a part in the, in the discussion that we were having. Nobody really thought about coming back from trauma or how to manage trauma or even consider that an, an important issue. So for me, I, you know, I always found myself coming back to this one point, which was, you know, it's, it's 100% necessary to push for gun control legislation. It's 100% necessary to make sure that the random laws that say you can get certain weapons before certain ages and, and that are more powerful than, let's say, a handgun, um, versus, you know, getting a handgun at 21, we have to square away that kind of a difference and make it, you know, a, um, a, a parity of circumstance for both cases. But the one thing that is most important, you know, that we, we were kind of overlooking was the mental health aspect. So for me, I decided to start a, a mental health nonprofit called the Societal Reform Corporation to do just that. I figured that if you could put holistic means of mental health mitigation or management into schools, and teach students how to mitigate their negative emotions as they were coming, um, then they would be less likely to resort to things like, you know, violence, and violence, uh, you know, overall just tremendously negative behaviors. Because a, a lot of the time, you know, that is the way people react to situations like that. They, they act out in an aggressive manner. And so, you know, I figured that if we can get people into meditation, get people into EFT tapping, um, and into affirmations, and into really just thinking about um, you know, becoming their, the, their actualized self that could probably inspire people to, um, to kind of carry on in, in a way that was more conducive to a positive reality. 
And so a lot of the work that I do surrounds that. Um, and, and, you know, and when I was doing this work, I found that a lot of people um, always particularly thought, well, you know, how are we going to stop this tragic circumstance with, uh, with mental health? And what, and what role does that play, you know, in this circumstance? And so, you know, I, I oftentimes had to explain that um, anyone who's willing to um, go into any kind of a circumstance or situation and, and carry out a, hor a horrific act or a tremendously violent act um, for, you know, really just um, the main reason being mismanaged emotions a lot of the time is not um, properly equipped to, you know, be a, a, a proper and conducive member to, you know, society as we understand it. And so, you know, that's the work that I've done. And that's, um, that answers your first question there. Okay, I got one more follow up question, and then I'm gonna bring in my, my secret weapon. You know, I was dealing with a, client, uh, a company in Canada that wanted me to do some work with them, and they were helping people um, overcome anxiety and depression and a lot of these other, you know, mental health challenges. And basically, their disposition was almost all mental health issues are connected to stress. You know, if you're stressed out over an extended period of time, it can crawl all kind of havoc on your body, your mind, your soul. So you talk about stress management, meditation, mindfulness. You know, I call it locating myself. You know, every morning I grab a cup of coffee and I just sit there and I try and locate myself. Am I happy? Am I sad? Am I angry? Am I frustrated? And I remember one time, you know, I've been married 27 years, right? And so my wife and I used to get into it sometimes. And I realized a lot of times I was just out of place. I was out of pocket. So now before I even talk to my wife about anything, I go on to access my emotions, you know? And, and, and honestly, 93% of the time now, I can get it all worked out in my own mind. Like, you know what, my bad, I'm tripping, <laughs> right? And, and I can say that now as a 51 year old man um, because I've been able to grow and mature, but all young people clearly understand that stress is not good. Stress is not healthy. And if you're stressed out, if you're dealing with something traumatic, something that is really bothering you, either go get some help from a professional or sit down and talk to somebody. You know what, the truth will set you free. Sometimes it's just about being honest. You know what, sometimes it's just about, I'm angry because my dad left or I'm mad because of my mom was too strict or whatever it is. Sometimes we just gotta deal with it. So it sounds like you dealt with a lot of your um, stress through meditation and mindfulness. In 30 seconds before we bring in our secret weapon, what does mindfulness actually mean? Help, help educate us, old folks. Yeah, so, you know, in layman's terms, I would want to say mindfulness, you know, think about quieting the mind as the ultimate goal. Um, you know, because a lot of people have intrusive thoughts and, you know, thoughts that cause um, them to feel stressed out. Like, oh my God, you know, while you're, um, you're talking to your friends, you're also thinking, oh, I've got my rent due in two weeks. How am I going to pay that? You know, I've got this, uh, this exam coming up in the next week. How am I going to pass that? You know, so it, it's about trying to get to a place of singular thoughts and being present, not thinking necessarily about what you have to accomplish in the future, but, you know, realizing where you're at and what is in your control in this, prison, in this present moment. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I'm glad that you brought up the, um, the topic of, you know, stress having physical implications on your health, because, um, you know, we see this all the time in people with, who suffer post-traumatic stress, all the way up to uh, people who are just average everyday university students. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times my friends in Parkland have said that they've developed, you know, new stress-related illnesses, like uh, things to do with their stomach, things to do with their prostate. Um, you know, things to do with all kinds of random areas across the body. Um, and, and even as far as, you know, with university students, as I mentioned before, um, you know, a lot of these problems through intense, intense stress at schools like MIT or just any random university, um, you know, we're having a larger increase in students developing all, all kinds of stress-related illnesses. And so the reason for that is because they're not being taught how to properly mitigate their stress. There's a is an intense focus on trying to become the most academic person you can become, um, which is you know loading yourself up with APs in high school, loading yourself with those classes, and then in college it's you know you're carrying that same mentality that you know was inspired and fostered in you in, in high school and saying well okay 
even though I'm studying what I'm interested in for a lot of people, you know, I want to keep up with my friends and I want to make sure I'm not slacking, right? Which is, it's a very interesting, you know, mindset because uh, those are two different ends of the spectrum educationally. But uh, nonetheless, that is a very popular mentality in the uh, American educational system. And, you know, even I would imagine in, in, in the international educational systems. Um, so if, if we really bring the, the idea of mental health management into the form of, or bring it into the fold of actual education uh, and, not, and, and counting that towards, you know, academic progress, I think we could really make a huge difference. Well, you know, let, let me say this as we bring Jalen in, you know, the NBA is a client. And so I'll do programs for NBA rookies. Um, they have a program called the NBA Top 100 where they bring in the top 100 high school ball players in the country. And we had a psychologist come in and she asked all of the ball players a question. Now, mind you, I'm a former ball player. It was a bunch of former ball players. And she goes, you know, how do you guys deal with stress? And we all were like, what are you talking about? Like, how do you guys deal with stress? You know, ball players, we're a little cocky. You know, we think we're on top of the world. And I was like, even in the back, I was like, what is she talking about? She was like, how do you guys deal with stress? And everybody looked around like, chick, we're on top of the world. What are you talking about? And then she began to break it down. She goes, well, why do you guys drink so much? Ooh. Why do you guys smoke so much weed? Ooh. Why do you guys have much, so much sex? Why are you so promiscuous? And she taught us all in that moment, you guys are all dealing with stress. You just didn't even know it. And man, for me, I was like, wow. And she's right. Like, you think you're on top of the world, but man, you're playing in front of 20,000 people, 5 million people at home. You know, we all carry stress going way back to high school, being a high school basketball star, and we develop all these unhealthy behaviors, and we justify the thinking that we the man, we on top, we live in the life. And she really broke it down like, no, you guys all were trying your best to deal with stress in unhealthy ways. And we're talking about NBA pro athletes and very successful college athletes. So, you know, Kyle, I just want to encourage you to keep it going because we all deal with different kinds of stress and being a pro athlete, I can tell you're stressful, but we all deal with stress and stress, stress is a very personal thing. We're gonna open up the mic and give everyone a chance to ask some questions. But before I do that, I wanna bring in a special guest, uh, Jalen Cole. You know, in baseball, you have the closer. And so I wanna bring in Jalen. Uh, Jalen, how are you? I know you come from a long line of NAACP advocates, your dad, your grandfather. I know they're so proud of you. You know, tell us about the town hall meetings and kind of tell all of the, the students that are on the call tonight how they can have greater impact. Right, so I'm definitely happy to be here. And honestly, anybody else who's tuning in, if you're tuning in as a youth and college student and you're taking time out of your school week to be here, you're taking the first step by educating yourself because these town halls are a great, are a great way for you to learn more about that we often don't talk about. So thank you to everybody who's tuning in. Thank you for being on. These next upcoming months, we're gonna be having some more town halls specific to STEM college campuses and communities. So also tune into those. And then something we always like to say is it's not enough for you to just educate yourself. A true leader will get this new knowledge and then make sure they educate the other people around you. So if you know you have a friend who wasn't a part of this conversation that may be stressed, um, stressed recently and they need to know more about mental health, or you have a friend that you think would definitely be interested in becoming a donor, make sure you um, link them into and have them also participate in some of our upcoming events because it's not enough for you to just be here. We need everyone to be a part of this conversation. Now also a big thing we're talking about is gift of life. Um, go ahead and find out more information online if you need it. But if you know that this is something you wanna do, you wanna save lives, don't be afraid to go sign up and join the gift of life registry. Signing up is a really simple thing to do. It's really easy and you can save a life. If you're under the age of 18, yes, you do have to go and talk to your family and make sure it's okay with them. But that means that you might be able to get your parents to sign up too. And so that's three lives that could potentially be saved. It doesn't really do anything to harm you, but it does everything for somebody else who really needs that help. So make sure you go and do additional research if you need it. Ask questions when we get to the panel part if you um, need more information, but don't miss out on this opportunity. 
So something else that we do want to talk about, I know this has been a focus on health disparities and um, issues that revolve that revolve around health for the Black community, but a large conversation a lot of us have been having is, as we approach November 3rd is voting. If you're over the age of 18 and you want to make a difference, besides signing up to become a donor, something else you can do is get out and vote. We have one, two weeks, I believe, until November 3rd. Up until then, you can be early voting. And it's extremely important that everybody gets out and cast their ballot if you're able to. Everyone's been saying, vote like your lives depend on it. And I know we're all tired of it because we've been hearing that nonstop for the past couple of months. But beyond that, your vote is your voice. And if there's anything this year has shown, it's shown that we have systems in place in this country that oppress our black and brown communities when it comes to health, when it comes to education, when it comes to juvenile justice. But one thing we can't let anybody take away is our right to vote and the power that we get from voting. Every time we have an election, we have a chance to say who we want in office and what changes we want to see in our communities in all the areas that I just mentioned. So you need to make sure that you go and check your voting status, get any information you need from your supervisor of elections. They typically do try to work with people and make sure you can go and cast your ballot. Something we like to say in Tampa, I know with our youth council here for the NAACP is that voter registration without voter education leads to voter misrepresentation. So if you're concerned about any issues revolving around health, civic engagement, criminal justice, do research. Don't just go out and, you know, bubble in answers like you're taking a test that you didn't study for. Actually go and do the research before it's time to vote so you know who you're voting for and you know that your vote is not only counting, but it's counting towards helping your community. Because if you're out there and you're just voting, it's not doing as much as if you're voting for people you should actually be voting for. Now, I know I've gone through a lot and I'm speaking really fast because I want us to stay on schedule, but I'm going to end with this. If you're under the age of 18 like me and you cannot vote yet, that does not mean your voice does not matter. I know we're seeing all this stuff about how we need to vote. We need to vote immediately, but a lot of us still can't do it. That doesn't make you any less of a leader. It doesn't make you any less of an advocate. If you're 16 or 17 in the state of Florida, you can pre-register to vote to make sure you're ready for the next election. So make sure you go ahead and pre-register. And also make sure you yourself are educated. If you have issues that matter to you, don't be afraid to go ahead and ask the people running for office. You can't vote, but your uncles can, your aunts can, your parents can, and you're allowed to have an opinion or you're allowed to vo voice that opinion to the people that actually can cast your ballot. All right, so I believe that's all I have as far as things you can do, but you can also get involved with your local NAACP, if you're a college student, get involved with your college chapter. If you're a youth council student, get involved with your youth council. Um, but yeah, those are great ways to get involved, become a donor, become a voter, and become active. Well, Jayla, let me tell you something. We're going to bring everyone back on the screen right now as we, as we begin to prepare for a close. You know, the CEO of Wells Fargo made a statement and put his foot in his mouth. He says, it's not, it's not easy to find some black talent. Jalen, I want you to know you made us all proud tonight. Your dad, your grandfather. So whether you choose FAMU or Howard University, they're gonna be in for a treat uh, with your intellect and your potential. And no doubt you are, you are an impact player. I have a follow-up question for Dr. Wells um, as we get back to our sixth panel. Uh, Dr. Wells, in about 30 seconds or less, how can we get more people of color into health-related fields? Great question. And, and I think we need to start at, at and, and, and support initiatives that do that at every level, right? So it starts with identifying proficient uh, students like uh, the Jalen Coles of the world, like the Kai Corbers of the world, to, uh, to route them the right direction and then support them to and through uh, medical education. But we also need to think about uh, other areas that are supportive and ancillary uh, in, in healthcare that where minorities are un underrepresented also. So, you know, I think identifying scholars and then routing them to the right places in order that they might uh, complete an education, which requires support. So it, it's, it's support past the scholarship. Uh, it also is um, ensuring that there is engagement from and mentorship from uh, other minority medical professionals, right? So the doc that you described that is stellar and, and has a family full of, of clinicians, those docs should be a part of minority medical societies and those minority medical societies should be supporting and looking for students in their communities. 
and, and then you can't have this conversation without talking about the thousands and thousands of students who had have the, the aptitude, but because of the disparities that exist with educational access are not able to cultivate the skills that are necessary in order to demonstrate that aptitude. So I, I, I can't ever say that without talking about the importance of intervening upstream and ensuring that, that minority students are moving through the educational system and getting equipped with the appropriate skills that they need early on so that they can be identified and demonstrate proficiency at, at, when it's time to graduate. Love it, love it. Okay, Dr. Vera, we got to talk about it. Bone marrow transplant. Can sickle cell be cured through bone marrow transplant? I apologize. Can you repeat that, Walter? It broke up on my end for a second. Um, can a bone marrow transplant cure sickle cell? It can and it has and it continues to. Unfortunately for myself, I'm too old for a bone marrow transplant. But the young people on this line, um, the sicklers that are their age, they are benefiting from bone marrow transplants when they can find a donor. So please, I encourage all of you, um, all of you teenagers, young adults, please, 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 please get involved with Gift of Life, get in their registry. It's a quick little, you know, swap. They can mail it to your house. You don't even have to go anywhere and you mail it back. So please get involved with Gift of Life because you can literally save somebody's life. We need people of color in the registry because that's the only way that people with sickle cell who are people of color are going to get a match for a bone marrow transplant. So oh. that's, that's my personal plight. Even though I'm too old to get a bone marrow transplant, I'm putting a plug for all the, all the kids with sickle cell that I mentor that need a transplant match. Please everybody get everyone you know to get in the gift of life registry. Thank you. Love it doc, love it. Hey, hey, cool J, that's what I call J. LL cool J, just take us home. How can we get registered and how can we have an impact through the gift of life? Yep. So, uh, you know, first, Jalen, wow, you rock. Uh, you absolutely rock. You're incredible. So very, very quickly, um, building on what Karen just said, um, that cheek swab is what it's all about. Something that looks like a Q-tip. You order it from our website, giftoflife.org. It comes to your house. You swab your cheek. You put it back in this kit. You mail it in and you join the registry. 75% of people from black or multiracial backgrounds cannot find a match. We need to build the registry. We need to diversify the registry so that everybody has an equal opportunity. We call this democratization of transplant, democratization of finding matches. It's so important. The second thing is that people should not presume that what they see on TV with Hollywood with respect to movies and television shows is what bone marrow donation is all about. It's far from the truth. 80% of the time, we're not taking bone marrow at all. We're actually taking blood from your arm. It's very similar to donating platelets. You get to, uh, you get to watch Netflix. You get to sit with a family member. Um, you get to enjoy yourself and relax. And when it's all over, you've donated your stem cells and you've saved a life. So it is not the scary thing that Hollywood portrays. It's so important that people understand that and we dispel that rumor. So get swabbed. Let's improve outcomes for everybody out there equally. Well, thank you, Jay. And you know what, tonight, I just wanna say thank you to all of our gifts. I uh, started with LL Cool J, you are our first gift. Uh, Dr. Wells, Dr. Vieira, uh, Kai, uh, Kai out there in, in, in California, and Jalen. I mean, my God, you're in high school having major impact. You know, we covered it all. You know, there's a lot coming against the African American community, the Black, Indigenous, people of color, but let's not think like victims. You know what? We talked about either being a spectator or a participant. You know what? I'm done being a freaking spectator. It's time for us to be participants. I'm going to do my part to be an impact player. And all I need is everybody on tonight's call to do your part to be an impact player. Get registered. Get the swab. So people, you can save a life. I wish my uncle was still alive. I wish he was still here. He could have coached me and mentored me through my pro career. And I never got experience to enjoy him as a mentor 
because he passed away of leukemia, a blood cancer, a blood disease. This is real, guys. These diseases kill. Mental health kills. All of our health disparity, racism and medicine, what? That's crazy to me. So we got to bring attention to all of this. And I need everybody on tonight's call to make a commitment to be an impact player and don't be a spectator anymore. Go and be a participant, whether it's voting, whether it's getting your mouth swapped, whether it's going to get checked out if you're struggling with your mental health, encouraging your brother or your sister. Stress is not good for any of us. And when you are a person of color, you're born into stress. It is what it is. But I believe adversity will increase your value if it let it. God bless you guys tonight. Thank you to our panel. Thank you to the NCAACP. Thank you for all of our sponsors. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And remember that we all have a chance to impact and be a gift of life. See you guys soon.